Good morning and good afternoon. My name is John Herbst and I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we're having a wonderful event for you on this morning is this afternoon, depending upon where you are, regarding the Biela Viesia Accords, as we call it the autopsy of an empire. Uh, th that was a signature historical event, which led to the end of the Soviet Union. We did an event on this five years ago with some of the participants at the time, uh, including uh, the president of Ukraine, Leonid uh, Kovchuk. And we now have an event with people who are very active in the countries um, that are affected by this, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Belarus. We, have a, we will start with a wonderful study presented by uh, Elena Biberman, uh, Dr. Elena Biberman, and Zach Trinovsky, who have done um, yeoman work researching Belarusia, and they'll talk about some of their findings. And then we'll have a panel discussion, which includes um, Vladimir Karamuza, a very important opposition politician in Russia, Alex Shamshur, a distinguished uh, retired diplomat in Ukraine, former deputy foreign minister, ambassador to Washington, to Paris, and a distinguished Belarusian journalist, um, Hanna Lubakova. And with that, uh, we will begin our conversation. So this is going to be a moderated conversation. I'll be asking our presenters and our, our panelists about about Bielovesia, and then we'll take audience questions. So, um, Dr. Bieberman, what are the Bielovesia Accords? When was it, and what happened there? For those in the audience who have not paid as close attention as we have. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here on this historic occasion. So the Bielovesia Accords is an agreement that dissolved the Soviet Union 30 years ago on December 8th, 1991. It declared officially that the Soviet Union ceased to exist and it established the Commonwealth of Independent States. This document was conceived and signed during a weekend at the Visculi Hunting Lodge in Belarus's Bilaveja Forest, which is part of the pre uh, primeval forest that used to span Europe. It's a very beautiful place. It was signed by leaders of three of the four republics that originally signed the treaty that actually created the Soviet Union in December 1922, exactly 70 years prior to that moment. Um, Belarusian leader Stanislav Shushkevich, he organized this meeting to negotiate a new gas and oil trade agreement with Moscow. The goal, the original goal was not to dissolve the Soviet Union, but this weekend things transpired. So what happened? Well, there was an unsuccessful hunt, dinner, vodka, banya, which some of you knows a Russian bath, and a lot more. And this is the story that Zach and I tell in our podcast called How to Kill a Superpower Lessons from the USSR. Okay, thank you. That's a good introduction. Okay, Zach. Um, you and Yelena have done wonderful podcasts with great texture. In the show, you say that the leaders of the Soviet Union, the Soviet, Soviet Socialist Republics of Ukraine and Belarus had written down their working agreements and a housekeeper tossed them out. The leaders then had to scramble and root through the garbage to find, in essence, the document on the end of the Soviet Union. What other moments stand out? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question, Ambassador. Uh, the... One thing that we spent a lot of time in the podcast on that has always stuck out to me was the phone calls placed on the day uh, that the Bellevue Accords were signed that were outgoing from the Vistuli Hunting Lodge, the calls that were placed to the Minister of Defense, Shaposhnikov, uh, to, to George Bush, and to Gorbachev. We spent a lot of time in the podcast dissecting a lot of the details surrounding these calls, whether that's you know the timing of them, whether or not they were placed from the same room, and then whether or not all of that was intentional. And as we found, there are actually sort of long reaching impacts of all of these tiny details. Uh, beyond that, I think another moment that really stuck out that we also spent a lot of time with was the moment that Berbulis proposes to, to the leaders at the hunting lodge, you know, what if we were to dissolve the, the Soviet Union? And we spent a lot of time analyzing this because we found it very strange that Shushchevich was actually the first to stand and agree. Um, there are a lot of things that go into that. And through our podcast, we talk about this idea of spontaneity and momentum. And I think that those moments really encapsulate those two things very well. So those have stuck with me a lot. Okay, thank you. Yildena, why did you begin this project? And how did you pull Zach into it? 
So this is my post-tenure passion project. Um, I had just gotten tenure at Skidmore College and I was kind of open to some, doing something creative, a little non-academic. Um, so at the time I was listening to a podcast called Wind of Change and there they're looking into um, the song called Wind of Change by the Scorpions that they kind of think that the CIA might have been behind in their effort to you know, help to bring down the Soviet Union. Well, I thought to myself, wait a second, there was actual event that dissolved the Soviet Union. And then I realized not many people know about it. And I started thinking about why is that most people know about the fall of the Berlin Wall, but very few people, if anyone, you know, maybe just a bunch of academics and some politicians, they know about the Bilavieja Accords, right? So there was a real puzzle there. Why do we have this hole in our memory? Um, why aren't they being celebrated, um, right? So. Also, there was sort of a personal reason that the maybe the Bill of Vision Accords, why I kind of even thought of them is because they occurred um, at, at the location. So my family and I uh, are from Belarus. And at the time they were signed, we were there. Um, and nobody, nobody knew about that. I just remember nobody talked about that. And I even later, so my family and I, we, are, we were refugees. We immigrated to the United States in 1992. And I asked my family recently, you know, do you know anything about Bilavieja? And they never heard of them. So I was like, that's so strange. So it's not just in the West, in the United States, nobody knows about them. But also the people who lived in the very country where it happened don't know much about them either. And also coincidentally, my family and I arrived in the U.S. on December 8th, 1992, exactly one year after they were signed. So that date, December 8th, was always very special to me. And I think that's why I kind of remembered hearing about the Bilavieja. So I thought, OK, we, we have to... I have to look into this, <laughs> like, and what, like, what actually happened, right? Um, so there was a mystery to be solved. Um, at the same time, you know, living through the pandemic, it's a difficult time for the world and the United States. A lot of political kind of upheaval to some extent, and I started to see these parallels um, between the what was happening in the United States and Soviet Union uh, of my childhood. So there were things like public mistrust of the government. Uh, this was the case in Belarus, in Soviet Union, Belarus, especially after the Chernobyl accident. And then sort of there was a bit of a parallel I felt with the pandemic, Afghanistan sort of not being able to win there and then uh, withdrawing ultimately. Um, another parallel I was kind of seeing a sort of gerontocracy at the highest levels of power, this unwillingness to let go to some extent. And of course there was a shortage of toilet paper, which really was like, oh wow, this is very similar and very unexpected. So having witnessed and lived through one collapse, I certainly did not want to um, witness and live through another one. So I was like, okay, I just, I wanna know what happened. How is it that the Soviet Union actually ended? Um, Keep in mind that nobody predicted that the Soviet Union would dissolve. The CIA didn't predict it. Um, the president, George H. W. Bush, didn't predict it. Um, in the Soviet Union, nobody thought it would happen. So, uh, in fact, George W. Bush, H. Um, w. Bush, um, uh, warned uh, Ukrainians just a few months earlier not to pursue what he called suicidal nationalism. So, the U.S. did not even want this. Um, and then Zach it, it was my student. Uh, he's a second generation immigrant from the Soviet Union. So here I thought was a natural partner to join me on this journey. Okay. Uh, actually, let, uh, let me just jump in for a second. Unfortunately, I'm having a senior moment, but there is there was a, a Soviet dissident writer who predicted the end of the Soviet Union. I'm forgetting his name right now, but I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Andrei Amalric. He wrote a book, That's right. the USSR Survival Till 1984. He was wrong by seven years. Yes, correct, correct. And you can even make the argument that Kennan's notion of containment going back to the 40s had this in mind at some point, although Kennan certainly in the 80s was not a seer. Okay, so Zach, this actually, this actually, this question relates precisely to what we we're just talking about. It's very hard to predict the future. And in your research, uh, you saw, you found a CIA document predicting how the USSR might develop in the future. And there were four scenarios, chronic crisis with few changes, that's one, two, independence for some, but not Central Asia, Belarus, or Ukraine, that's two, three, martial law totalitarianism, and four, a violent and chaotic collapse. Uh, well, I guess that really didn't, none of those happened. Uh, why do you think no one saw what would happen? Yeah, so I, this definitely is a great tie-in from what we were just talking about. Um, but I think that 
obviously, you know, there are some people who have had uh, that were predictions made. Some people, you know, could sort of see that that the Soviet Union was was headed for uh, a sort of dissolution or collapse. But across the board, the majority of people hmm. always viewed this as something that was impossible. And nowadays, the majority of people view it as something that was inevitable. And, and that's something that we focus on a lot in the podcast is how, you know, over these past 30 years, that change in perspective has kind of dominated the, the cultural mindset about the Soviet Union. Um, but when it comes to, you know, why did none of these options uh, play out exactly how they did? I think something that our podcast really goes into and shows is that at multiple moments throughout the weekend at the Vistuli Hunting Lodge, the decisions that were made and the way that people acted changed the outcome. So if you dive in that close and you see, oh, at any of these given moments over just one weekend, the way that this played out could have changed, it makes it a lot easier to see why it's almost impossible to predict, um, you know, exactly how this dissolution would, would be carried out. And retrospectively, there are some factors that we can, you know, take and, and build into our framework, like the fact that Gorbachev was very adamant about a peaceful dissolution after the fact. And, you know, knowing that we can go back and say, all right, maybe this fragmentation wouldn't happen uh, the way it would, or, the, or this, uh, you know, martial law totalitarianism. But there are, for every, you know, known quantity that we have now, there are dozens more questions and, and sort of unknown factors that we still have to incorporate into our framework. But the other big aspect of this, which, which I uh, touched on earlier, is spontaneity. Um, and it's a topic that academics struggle with a lot and then kind of choose to ignore some of the time in, in favor of, you know, theories that take into account a wider context and say, oh, you know, spontaneity plays a small role here. This, these contextual factors are the real driving force, but I don't think it should be counted out uh, so easily. And that, that's something that we definitely try to uh, focus on a lot throughout the, throughout the five episodes. <laughs> uh, Zach, regarding spontaneity, of mm -hmm. uh, the way you describe Bielovizia, right? They they to talk about uh, hydrocarbon supply to Belarus, and it came became the end of the Soviet Union. It's worth calling reminding that the Constitutional Convention in the United States in Philadelphia um, began as a talk talk between Maryland and Virginia about uh, trading issues between these two states. So these this is spontaneity is real. Yeah, is what political scientists would like to believe. Okay. And actually, one more point. I'm sorry, I'm doing too much talking. But I was working in the State Department. I was the head of the Soviet Economic Desk from 1988 to 1990. And there was a relatively senior person at the CIA, his name was Rowan, who was saying that, in fact, the Soviet Union was in its last days. Though that was never reflected in the, uh, you know, the documents, the intelligence assessments coming out of the agency. Okay, so let's, let's broaden this. So Vladimir, um, President Putin has long lamented the end of the Soviet Union. You recently made headlines saying that it re represented a loss of historical Russia. What do you make of that? Uh, excuse me, Putin said it made a, a loss of historical Russia. What do you make of that? Is in the Kremlin's current threats to escalate the war with Ukraine, is Putin invoking the old history of Russian empire? Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Herbst, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for hosting this uh, important conversation and to Elena and Zach for uh, sharing the story of their new important podcast with, with all of us and with our audience. Uh, I was in St. Petersburg just a few days ago for a conference on Russian parliamentary history that takes place uh, every December at the Taurid Palace, the seat of the old imperial state Duma before the revolution, also where the Russian Constituent Assembly met for one day before being forcibly dissolved by the Bolsheviks in January 1918. And but every December, historians, but also former parliamentarians, because it's also about the history of, of, of post-Soviet parliamentarianism that this conference uh, is concerned with too. And one of the roundtables was actually on this very topic that we're discussing, the, uh, the end of the Soviet Union, the solution of the Soviet Union. And it sort of uh, very quickly turned from an academic roundtable into a, almost a shouting match between the parliamentarians who were on, on different sides uh, of this debate three decades ago. But what I think it's, uh, first of all, it, it is important to, to bear in mind for all of us uh, Yelena just outlined the uh, sort of the background to the Belavezhia Accords. And um, it's important to remember that it wasn't just signed by the three leaders, the three heads of state. It was also ratified by the parliaments uh, of all of the three countries involved, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. You know, one of the sort of leitmotifs of the uh, Kremlin propaganda today under Putin is that, uh, you know, that these three traitors, Yeltsin, Kravchuk, and, and Shushkevich, gathered in some forest in the middle of the night and signed this accord and, you know, dissolved the great 
the great Soviet Union. Well, first of all, let's not forget that two out of the three, namely Yeltsin and Kravchuk, were democratically elected by the countries. Belarus at the time did not have an elected uh, head of state. And also, as I just mentioned, that the Belarus Accord was ratified by overwhelming majorities uh, in the three parliaments of the countries that signed them, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. In Russia, uh, the Russian Supreme Soviet, as the parliament was called at the time, the Belarus Accords was ratified by 188 votes in favor and only six votes against. Let's not forget that what happened three decades ago was fully in line uh, with what public opinions in all three countries wanted. Uh, in Belarus, only one member of parliament voted against ratification, and it was not Lukashenko, despite what he tries to claim. It was a member of parliament called Tikhina. Uh, in fact, the greatest number of votes against ratifying the dissolution of the Soviet Union was in Ukraine, in Ukrainian parliament, 10 members against. But those came from the Ruch, and the reason they voted against was not because they wanted the Soviet Union to stay, but because they did not even want the CIS, the Commonwealth of Independent States. So they didn't want that mild form of integration in this was the reason for it. And so uh, it's important for us to bear in mind that this was not some uh, you know, some plot concocted by uh, by these three people in the middle of the night. It was it was a, an objective historical event that by that time was inevitable. Inevitable. Some of those parliamentarians uh, that I um, saw in St. Petersburg uh, reminded us by the beginning of December, actually, there were only three republics left in the Soviet Union, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. All the others had already declared independence, uh, including most prominently, of course, Ukraine in a referendum that was held in the beginning of December of 1991, uh, in which overwhelming majority, 90% voted in favor of independence, including in Donetsk and Lugansk regions, Crimea and Sevastopol. Let's not forget that as well. Uh, and so, you know, when Putin talks about historical Russia, quote unquote, uh, you know, historical Russia does not include Uzbekistan and Estonia. Uh, these are sort of the post-imperial uh, nostalgia uh, that, has, uh, that has become the sort of the pseudo ideological base uh, for the uh, for the Putin regime, uh, increasingly uh, the regime looks into the past rather than to the future because you know after 22 years in power, it's difficult to talk about the future. It's difficult to offer some sort of perspective for people going forward. So they try to uh, sort of uh, you know cling to this neo-Soviet nostalgia, uh, uh, and and so this this was of course the reason for all of these recent articles by Putin and Medvedev and his statement uh, several years ago that people continue to quote that the Soviet Union. The collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, talking about the century that, that had two world wars and a Holocaust. Um, I think what is important for us to keep in mind as well is what the alternative was. And we saw that alternative in Yugoslavia. And we saw the blood-soaked mess that happened there with hundreds of thousands of, of victims, with the relations between uh, the former republics of Yugoslavia soured probably for centuries going forward. And, and I think, you know, however difficult the process of dissolution of the Soviet Union was three decades ago. Um, I think we have a lot uh, to be thankful for to President Yeltsin, President Kravchuk, and uh, uh, Belarus Supreme Soviet Chairman mm -hmm. Stanislav Shushkevich for um, a, a dissolution that was as peaceful and as mild uh, as was possible uh, in those historical circumstances. Um, Vlad, I'm going to do a follow up question here because what you just said I think is very important. Uh, I agree with you that the demise of the Soviet Union was a blessedly peaceful event, despite all the chaos. But some observers suggest that we're, we were seeing the imperial um, impulse asserting itself. We saw it in Georgia. We're seeing it now in Ukraine. I mean, after, of course, it's, it's going on constantly also in, in uh, Moldova as well. But the point is that there's bloodshed in Georgia. Now there's bloodshed in Ukraine. How do you relate this? to Bielovezhia? Uh, I think this relates not so much to Bielovezhia as to the domestic politics of Russia, because one of the um, well-established patterns that we see in the modern history of Russia is that um, external aggression always follows domestic repression. The two are two sides of the same coin. Uh, and when we saw Russia domestically being, uh, you know, being aspiring to democracy and, and freedom and the rule of law, however imperfectly in the early 1990s, we saw this reflected in a much more peaceful, progressive, and pro-European foreign policy that characterized uh, Russian foreign policy under the early years of President Yeltsin's presidency. Uh, as soon as Putin came in, uh, and you know, th let's not forget that this neo-Soviet nostalgia informs not just his foreign policy, but most importantly, his domestic policy. And the first thing he did when he came to power in December of 1999 was to unveil a memorial plaque to Yuri Andropov, a longtime chairman of the Soviet KGB, to send an unmistakable signal 
of just which direction he was going to take our country and our part of Europe. Uh, and then, of course, in the first year of his presidency, Mr. Putin reinstated the Stalin era music of the Soviet national anthem as the national anthem of the Russian Federation. Again, very clear symbol. And of course, what came soon after was the closure of independent media outlets, the ejection of true opposition from parliament, uh, the imprisonment and later murders of opposition leaders, uh, and everything that we see uh, in the authoritarian regime of Vladimir Putin's uh, Russia today. And this was, of course, directly reflected in, in the Kremlin's foreign policy, too. There's no reason to expect a regime that tramples on the rights of its own people and that violates its own laws to be respectful of international norms or of the interests of other countries. And so naturally, we see uh, the resulting aggressive foreign policy uh, that we've been seeing for the past many years now. Uh, the, the great Russian historian Kluchevsky wrote that when Russia marches, the people suffer. Oh, he was exactly right. Okay. Yeah, what, what Kluchevsky also wrote uh, was that history doesn't teach anybody any lessons. It just punishes for lessons unlearned. And I think one day <laughs> Mr. Putin's regime will find out just how true that statement is. <laughs> okay. Alec, uh, of the countries we're talking about today, um, Ukraine is perhaps um, among the, maybe the most prominent. A democratic country working to reform itself, aligned with the West, it has spent nearly eight years suffering from Russia's war. Why can Putin let Ukrainian go? Uh, how does that relate to our conversation today? Well, John, uh, actually, uh, I think that no one could determine exactly what is in Putin, Putin's head. So we can only make an educated guess. And I think that uh, there is a dangerous, explosive sort of Putin cocktail of concepts uh, that are driving his policy towards Ukraine. Uh, firstly, and it was uh, spoken about today, one of his primary motivations lies in restoring Russia to his grandeur, either imperialist or more increasingly now through the spectacles of the uh, Soviet Union. And uh, such restoration, this is well known, is considered to be impossible without controlling Ukraine bringing it uh, back into the Russian fold this way or the other. And uh, I would like to mention also two ideological uh, things, uh, motivations you have, uh, well, referred to in a way. So uh, secondly, apart from the first one, uh, I think that, uh, and Vladimir spoke about that, his actions are very much motivated uh, by uh, his uh, interpretation of history and by the fact that he deeply and sincerely despises Ukraine and its people. In his mind, Ukraine is no state, it has no history of its own, and the Ukrainians are considered mm. as stray little brothers. And places like Kyiv are being considered as holy gray of the bigger true Russian history and culture that are accidentally uh, inhabited by Ukrainians. And thirdly, and exactly to what you mentioned, uh, Ukraine in its present form is really Putin's inferno as a family stated uh, economist. Uh, even in, in its present still under reformed uh, shape, it represents a viable democratic alternative to Putin's regime that has many facets of the Soviet style state capitalism. More Ukraine is democratic, stronger and successful, stronger will be its force of attraction to the Russians and people in the post-Soviet states. First, I would like to mention that his aim is not only installing at minimum in Ukraine, Yanukovych style, subservient government. It's larger than that. He would like to reverse Ukraine's choice of the Western model of development based on uh, the uh, democracy and competitive economy, and as well uh, as associated with it, uh, the choice of uh, uh, foreign policy, Western alliances. So he uses the image of Ukraine, uh, partnered with the West. Um, he, would uh, he tries to present it as the threat for Russia's security. I do not believe that he really believes that, but he uses that. In, uh, he use, uh, uses that in order to promote his foreign policy objectives, objectives but I would uh, uh, think that even more uh, as um, a kind of uh, um, cultivation of the enemy, image of the enemy at the Russia's uh, gates, and that is 
and that goes for domestic consumption. And sadly enough, we have to acknowledge that uh, he is rather successful, successful in the latter exercise, at least for the time being. Okay, thank you. Hannah, <clears throat> in the last year, Belarus has been defined by an extraordinary democratic movement to break with its authoritarian past and present. Why is this new generation of Belarusians finally challenged the system they grew up under? Thank you, Ambassador, for the question. Um, and I would propose to tackle some stereotypes uh, because I think the biggest stereotype that, that we heard um, about last year events is that people suddenly woke up. Um, but actually the society changed and evolved in the past years and it's been a long trend. Uh, so what contributed to it? Firstly, urbanization. Belarus is one of the most urbanized countries in the region. Um, and why is it important? Because it's a completely different life, um, other values and social standards. Obviously, uh, <clears throat> generational change happened. Currently, several generations play an active role uh, in the society and, and, and kind of thanks to technology, younger generation had a more significant uh, voice, more significant um, role than, than seniors. Uh, then if we look at the factor of education, the level of education, educated people has grown significantly in the past years. And this is uh, this also applies to the higher education um, and kind of people's social capital and intellectual level uh, has been growing really fast in the past years. Um, and I think really um, another really important factor that basically changed uh, the mentality of people was the growth of the private sector of the economy. Now there are um, some 50% of, of the economy is, is private sector. And this is not about numbers. Uh, this is a, not about statistics. This is about uh, private companies being more um, viable, being more economically viable than, than state-owned enterprises. And people see it. Um, and again, and this is a sort of huge change in, in people's mentality and this kind of they've been turning away from this Soviet style economy in, in Soviet style, style thinking. Um, so that's why also uh, this middle class that, that grew immensely in the past years had such a significant role in this revolution uh, in the uh, in 2020 in the past year. And obviously the reasons that that became really um, important last year was obviously COVID, was a stagnating economy, was the lack of progress. People did not see uh, any possibility of progress that, that, that might be possible with Lukashenko, so they did not believe in this anymore. This is obviously the mismanagement. This is um, uh, disrespectful attitude of Lukashenko towards people. This is general tiredness of people of Lukashenko. Uh, and obviously violations of elections, then torture, and then, then violence that took place. Um, so just to sort of uh, sum it up, um, the society changed and moved forward. Uh, Lukashenko stayed in the past. And I would say that what happened last year uh, was not even a revolution. This was evolution um, uh, because the, the time time has, has come in the first place and people were ready to, to say a definite no to, to Lukashenko. All right, thank you. Uh, Vlad, Russia was an empire for centuries. The Soviet Union expanded Moscow's control to its greatest extent. Putin seems intent on restoring the empire, at least partly. Is this inevitable? Or put another way, what might Russia's alternate future look like? Well, I think one of the biggest sort of historical and philosophical and political also debates uh, in our country in recent years and decades has been uh, whether we choose to uh, to go uh, the path of an empire or the path of a nation state. I think that is the most important question in a way also now, uh, as you know, people talk about uh, what comes after Putin. And I, I really want to draw on something that uh, on the point that both Yelena and Zach made um, at the beginning of this conversation, um, about how sudden and how unpredicted uh, the end of the Soviet regime was. And this is actually how things usually do happen in Russia. Think back also to 1905, 1917, of course, 1991, not just December, but August, uh, which in many ways was the time that actually decided the fate of the Soviet Union. What happened in December was just, well, essentially the signing of the death certificate. Uh, the, the death itself uh, happened in the three days of of August 1991. I think it's important to keep in mind too that nothing is uh, as permanent or as stable as it seems, certainly when it comes to authoritarian regimes in Russia. There was a book by a 
Berkeley professor uh, that came out, Alexei Yurchak, I think his name is, came out a couple of years ago, about the end of the Soviet empire. And then the title of the book is, it was supposed to be forever until it ended. Uh, and that, this is how things usually happen in our country. And so, uh, you know, to those of us who are in Russia and who are part of the opposition movement, uh, these are not just academic or historical debates, these are very practical issues because once there is a post-Putin Russia, which likely will happen like this, unexpected and unpredicted by any of us, uh, we will have to start uh, the important work of trying to reconstruct not only a, a democratic system which Putin destroyed, but also a nation state rather than an empire. Um, you know, Alexei Navalny, in one of his um, interviews not long before he was uh, poisoned last year, this was an echo of Moscow Radio, he was asked by uh, the presenter about what the program of the opposition is, what the program of his movement is, what, what, you know, what will the movement do if and when it comes to power. And I suppose the presenter was maybe expecting a long and drawn out response, you know, with some program points and specific policies and such. And Alexei responded with one simple phrase. He said, we want Russia to become a normal European country, end of quote. And this message was repeated earlier this week uh, when uh, Daria Navalny, Alexei's daughter, received the Sakharov Prize uh, awarded to him uh, by the European Parliament. And she said uh, in her speech before European parliamentarians uh, that, this is, that this is the goal uh, of the pro-democracy forces in Russia. We want Russia to become a normal European country, a part of Europe. And by the way, she said, we want Europe to stay Europe as well, uh, meaning to stay true to its values and not to try to compromise with or appease dictatorships. So this, I think, is a central point of our whole conversation. Yes, of course, Putin sees uh, Russia as an empire, but I think you know, all this, this neo-Soviet nostalgia and all of these uh, sort of harkings back to the past, this is no prospect for the future. They're just trying to cling on to something, the pseudo-ideological base that they're creating. The age of empires is over. And this is not going to happen. And I think those, those of us who are responsible, who are patriotic in the best sense of this word, who are thinking about the future of our country, need to find the best way to create a modern democratic nation state in Russia. Uh, you know, Boris Nemtsov once uh, recalled how um, he had asked Margaret Thatcher, who had a fascination with uh, post-Soviet democratic Russian Nazis who would come to visit, including uh, him in Nizhny Novgorod, where he was governor in the early 1990s. And, uh, you know, I was, was really involved and, and really personally interested in And Boris Nemtsov once asked um, uh, Lady Thatcher why she was so interested uh, in, uh, in, in, in Russia. And she answered, it's because we have something very important in common, the complex of a lost empire. Uh, and, you know, the Brits with sometimes better, sometimes worse success. But overall, I think it's fair to say that they have overcome this complex of a lost empire by now. Um, there's no doubt that we in Russia will as well. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the most uh, sort of, to me, one of the most important signs in this direction was a recent poll uh, by the Levada Center, to the last uh, remaining independent uh, polling agency in Russia. Uh, this is a poll from September of this year, so about two and a half, three months ago, uh, which posed the proverbial guns and butter question, uh, which asked people, what's more important to you, to have a high quality of life, a high standard of living for you and your family, or for Russia to be a quote unquote great power feared and, and, and respected by, uh, or even feared rather than respected by, uh, by the rest of the world. And two thirds, two thirds came out for butter over guns. Two thirds of Russians in that Nevada center poll said that for me and my family, it's more important to have a high quality and high standard of life rather than to have this ephemeral, you know, great power status and to be feared, uh, feared by everybody else in the world. And th this I think, is one of the strongest testimonies uh, to the fact uh, that Putin's neo-Soviet, neo-imperial project is doomed to failure. The question is only when. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw something else out here, um, Vlad, for you to consider. A lot of people argue that you know, Russia is fated to be a, an authoritarian regime for forever. This is its past, this is its future. And while I believe that history is an important indicator of what will happen to a country, it strikes me that to succeed in the world today, uh, an empire is not, is not a viable option. You have to unleash your people so that they can creatively make their mark in a global economy. And we, we both agreed that you know when Russia marches, the Russian people suffer. So I think this is a reason to be optimistic about Russia's future, because if, if, if the Putin style of politics continues, domestic and foreign, Russia is slated to become less and less powerful. 
the economy will not sustain a great power status if it's declining, relatively speaking. Any thoughts you may have? Well, to put it sort of in the most succinct way I've, I've ever heard this put, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, uh, Grigory Yavlinsky, a veteran, well-known uh, Russian uh, democratic politician, former deputy prime minister many years ago, wrote that there are only two choices. Either Russia will become a democracy or it will cease to exist, uh, which I think is he's making the same point as you just made here. But uh, more dramatic. To, <laughs> to the, exactly, exactly. And then more briefly, too. And, and the, to the point that you sort of raised, uh, you know, this notion somehow that we still hear being voiced by sometimes by Western academics and politicians and journalists that, oh, you know, you, those Russians, they can't do democracy. They just, all they can do is live under an author, under the yoke of an authoritarian regime, under a strong hand, as people put it. You know, to me, this is uh, probably the most offensive, the most insulting, and also speaking as a historian by education, one of the most false stereotypes uh, ever to be put forward. Uh, about my country. This, by the way, has been said about many countries. Russia is not the only country about which it was said that you know it's destined to live under authoritarianism. This, this was said about Germany. This was said about Spain. This was said about many, many other countries, uh, most or all of which today are successful and functioning liberal democracies. Uh, President Reagan, in his famous Westminster speech in 1982, referred to this view as, quote, cultural determinism or worse. Oh, forgive me, cultural condescension or worse, end of quote. Um, President, uh, former Estonian President Thomas uh, Henry Illes uh, calls it even more bluntly, he calls it a racist argument to suggest uh, that, you know, some countries or some peoples are just, you know, not worthy to live under democracies and are destined to live under authoritarian regimes. So I, I, I don't think I need to explain why it is insulting to me as a Russian to hear of you like that. But uh, more importantly, uh, even than the fact that it, it is insulting is the fact that it is simply false. Uh, you know, again, as Somebody with a, with a historian's education, I prefer to to go by the facts rather than myths and stereotypes. And if you look uh, at every time, uh, admittedly not many times, but every time in the modern history of Russia, uh, when Russian citizens actually got to choose between democracy and authoritarianism in a more or less free election, every time they went for democracy. 1906, the first election to the Russian State Duma that was overwhelmingly won by the cadets, the Constitutional Democrats, the, party of uh, leading party of reform at the time and the supporters of czarist autocracy failed to win a single seat zero um, 1917 elections to the constituent assembly which were held after the forceful seizure of power by the bolsheviks and the bolsheviks lost uh, to parties advocating for a democratic republic of course the assembly as we know was disbanded by force and 1991 the year that's the focus of our conversation today exactly three decades ago when in the first ever direct election for head of state in the thousand year history of Russia, Boris Yeltsin, the candidate of the democratic opposition, defeated uh, Nikolai Rishkov, former Soviet premier and the candidate of the ruling communist party of the Soviet Union by 57% to 17. These are the facts rather than myths and stereotypes. There's no conceivable reason why, you know, there's, you know, everybody else in Europe can live under democratic rule. There's just one country in Europe, or maybe two. Some people say the same about Belarus, Russia and Belarus. Those two are destined somehow. Look, I don't even think we need to, to talk about this seriously. Uh, you know, if uh, we know that the way Putin holds on to power is by repression, is by rigging elections, is by not allowing opponents on the ballot or imprisoning or poisoning or murdering them. Uh, would he need to do that if his neo-Soviet, neo-imperial project really had popular support in the country? I think that's... Uh, that's a rhetorical question. Uh, and when that day finally comes, which I no doubt it will, uh, when Russian citizens get to have a free choice in a free election between democracy and authoritarianism, um, I'm confident that the choice will be made uh, the same as it was made every time before. Okay, thank you. All right, remind the audience, if you have questions, put them in the question section, which is there for you. Okay, Oleg, when the Soviet Union fell and Ukraine became independent, what was the vision for its future and what is its vision today? Actually, today we are speaking about many events and it's one of the events which I witnessed myself as I'm old enough uh, uh, to be, uh, to were rather present at, uh, the, uh, at the dissolution of the Soviet Union and uh, Ukraine uh, regaining independence. So the overall feeling was definitely of shedding Russian uh, domination and getting out of the Soviet confines, uh, habits and practices. It's also important to say 
that independence was perceived not simply as living separately from Russia, which was important. And the more we learned about uh, the history of our coexistence with the Brazilian uh, nation, more uh, that was important. But it was also important to live according to the democratic principles and rules and achieving substantially higher level of life. So uh, I would say that the general um, feeling was uh, that of enthusiasm. But at the same time, uh, we have learned quite uh, soon that transition period proved to be much more painful and old habits and ways uh, appeared uh, much more tenacious. Our development was further complicated uh, by uh, the initial lack of the societal consensus about strategic goals, by over-representation of the old party nomenclature in the structures of uh, power. And also, uh, uh, it's important to mention that um, there was an influence, uh, nefarious influence of the pro-Russian forces, uh, which largely relied on the so-called cheap Russian gas that corrupted Ukrainian economy and Ukrainian politics. However, I would argue that in spite of that, democratic development was always um, predominant in Ukraine, in Ukrainian society, with some notable exceptions of the late Kuchma and Yanukovych period. In those cases, in 2004, 5, 13, 14, uh, there was a huge society pushed uh, back. Uh, the revolutions, notwithstanding opposition of the power and the cost, sometimes uh, the cost in the second case of the human lives. I'm convinced uh, that we in 2014 passed point of no return as to the choice of the model of development by rejecting neo-Soviet Putin model and in favor of the model based, as I said before, on democratic principles and competitive economy. This, of course, involves the choice of alliances. I think that uh, both choices uh, will dominate our future, no matter that we are going through a, ra a rather rough period in our domestic and especially uh, foreign external policies. Domestically, I think uh, we have to finish the process of transformation, especially, uh, I would say that we should concentrate and you know that very well on judicial reform, Without that, we cannot uh, speak seriously about controlling at least corruption. Energy reform, uh, radically raising efficiency of the governance and transiting to the knowledge-based economy. We have assets and we can move in this direction compared to the heavy industry of the Soviet times. And of course, uh, radically limiting the power of oligarchs, radically and uh, really not uh, using those superficial uh, cosmetic measures that were um, used recently by the current power. And of course, externally, our war uh, with Russia is uh, for Ukraine is an existential one. It's about sovereignty, but it's also about ideology. So it's democracy versus dictatorship. To, uh, to confront Russia uh, efficiently, we should continue the path of reforms, strengthen unity within Ukraine, which is still a problem, and create efficient security and defense capability with assistance of our partners. Just to finish, uh, I think that we will live with Russian uh, threat for a while, for a considerable period of time still, uh, but definitely we uh, cannot give up uh, because uh, surrender to coercion, uh, surrender to blackmail is no option, neither for us nor for the West. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Hannah. I have a question for you that I'm going to also include an audience question because it's similar. My question is, do you think that the democratic movement to topple Lukashenko is, a, is an attempt to fulfill what might be called the promise of self-determination made at Bielovizia? So that's my question. But then also from the audience, what would a future democratic Belarus look like? Right. Thank you very much for, for this uh, two great questions. So, so if we sort of 
um, analyzed people in 1991 uh, or 1994 when they elected Lukashenko. This was a society that had no cohesive affiliate, that had no relevant national narrative. These were definitely Soviet citizens. Um, and if we compare them to what uh, people we saw last year, I think when I kind of looked into this sociological research, um, really interesting factor, mobilizing factor for protesters, um, for me was that they were actually dissatisfied with the lack of opportunities and possibility to develop for self-development. And this applies to basically a whole society, to IT specialists, to kindergarten teachers, to doctors, uh, to workers, and so on. Um, and this is so interesting, right? So this is uh, not a Soviet citizen anymore. Uh, 2020 was a moment when um, fatigue and dissatisfaction with the government that accumulated over the years finally exploded. Uh, I talked previously about this uh, alienation between the government and people, and this organization of power became really visible. And what was last year, what we saw last year, was uh, not only a political or ethical disagreement, this was uh, rejection, this was disgust um, of Lukashenko. Last year, Lukashenko was obviously able to preserve this 20-30% of his um, um, voters, of, of his support, but he antagonized millions of Belarusians who were previously undecided or apolitical. And I usually joke that Lukashenko is the founding father of the Belarusian democracy. This is not obviously in a positive sense, but in a negative sense. He vaccinated people against um, a, a dictatorship, basically, against authoritarianism, and they now one democracy they uh like it gives me a lot of hope it gives me a lot of optimism that after 2020 belarusians will never allow um a tyrant tyrant uh, a dictator become become a president and i think what's also important last year uh, was that this national identity also not began to develop but basically a sort of um um, it was another sort of break to, to, to this development of national identity. Uh, look at the historic uh, white, red, white flag that was so widespread in Minsk and other cities. Belarusians were singing uh, songs, uh, like uh, protest songs in Belarusian. Um, and um, as the, the, the protest last year was not a fight between the West and East in Belarus. This was not a geopolitical revolution, but I think since um, with time, actually, uh, this uh, choice uh, between the West and the East in Belarus would become more and more also important. Um, and I think another uh, sort of important outcome of the past year was uh, this emancipation of women um, and basically this nonviolence and peacefulness, which became also another value, another sort Sort of peace that defines our identity as Belarusians, uh, which kind of people uh, uh, consider, right, really uh, is really important. So when we compare 1991-1994 when Lukashenko was uh, elected and 2020, 2020 is all about self-development, is all about national identity, values, uh, people taking matters in their hands. Um, all this shows that, again, this is not uh, a Soviet citizen anymore in Belarus. These are, um, these, this, is, uh, this is a new society. Uh, thank you. All right, um, Yelena, I'll give you the, my final question and I'll throw in a question from the audience for you. Um, what does the end of the Cold War tell us about great power competition in today's world? That's my question. Hey, thank you. Actually, listening to this, our conversation today triggered a memory for me. Uh, the year was 2006, and I was a Fulbright scholar in Moscow. And it was at Spaso House, actually. And the event um, was Tom Friedman was promoting his uh, new book, The World is Flat. And it was Ambassador William Burns at the time, who I could tell immediately was amazing. <laughs> and so I was at this event. And a question, uh, I think Tom Friedman asked audience question. This was mostly Russian audience. Uh, you know, when do you think Russia will stop wanting be, to be an empire? When will it cease to have this motivation to, to, um, to be an empire? And somebody got up in the audience, a Russian um, speaker, and asked, well, when will the United States stop wanting to be an empire? And that was very striking to me uh, as a Fulbright scholar. And um, so I think sort of looking into the future at great power competition, um, it's important to recognize how lucky we got by we, I mean, Americans, right? How lucky we got, as uh, Vladimir reminded us, it could have been like Yugoslavia, but with nuclear weapons. Uh, it could have ended very badly, um, this, this Cold War with Soviet Union. Um, 
So, you know, before getting into another competition with China, we should explore all the other options, right? Um, as there's a lot of talk right now with another Cold War starting with China, uh, what we have learned from Bilavieja is what historians have been telling us all along is we don't learn from history, right? This is what Vladimir reminded us as well. Um, but if we were to learn from history, we'd learn that history happens sometimes very unexpectedly. And some of the big things that happen, um, again, happen spontaneously, unexpectedly, unpredictably. There are always people, we call them super forecasters, who can predict things, but majority cannot, right? And there's always somebody predicting something. So how do we know whom to listen to, ultimately? Um, so sort of getting into this new Cold War with China, this new great power competition, we should realize that we got lucky the first time, we may not get lucky again, um, that change could happen quickly. And this is a, this is a source of hope for uh, people um, like Vladimir, for activists. And But, you know, again, it could go either way. Uh, uh, the historic decisions can be very unpredictable. Um, leadership and personalities matter, right? If it wasn't Gorbachev, what if it was somebody like Putin at the helm of the Soviet Union? I think the reaction would not have been so peaceful, right? Um, and also the importance of sort of having the direct lines of communication, right? So uh, President George H.W. Bush, his personal relationship to both Gorbachev and Yeltsin was very instrumental in sort of this very lucky moment, this, uh, this peaceful decline. Um, so we are to just, you know, be humble and, and be careful. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience, which again I'll give to you. Um, would Bielovich have happened without the August coup attempt in Russia, in Soviet Union? Yes. Well, I love counterfactuals, right? So this is an important moment. So the, the August coup really sort of cemented in the minds of um, the, the population, the Soviet people, that, you know, going back was not really an option anymore. Um, you know, the, this, this, you know, Yeltsin on top of a tank uh, made him so popular, uh, really gave him that legitimacy that when the decision at Bilaveja was made, he knew that the people were behind him and not Gorbachev. So it was a very important moment. It was what we would call a necessary, but not a sufficient condition to bring down the Soviet Union. All right, we have a question. I'll give it first to Vladimir. It's from Eugene Kamarov from the VOA Russia service. Um, he writes, Jan Pshaki told reporters in Air Force One that there will be no talks on European security without our allies and partners. We will not compromise the key principles on which European security is built, including that all countries have the right to decide their own future and foreign policy. Why does Russia want to discuss post-Soviet republics with the United States, without the post-Soviet republics, and for that matter, without the U.S.'s European allies? Vlad, your uh, Well, the, I think the response is very simple, and it harkens back to the theme that, that you, Ambassador, and others have, have already raised during this conversation, is that uh, it, it's, it goes back to this neo-imperial image that Putin wants to create, and he doesn't consider these countries to be really countries. As Ambassador Shamshur um, said earlier in this conversation, Putin doesn't uh, believe, or at least he pretends not to believe that Ukraine is, is a sovereign independent state. He said so to George W. Bush in person at the Bucharest summit uh, in 2008. He said that, George, Ukraine is not really a state. You know that. Um, Radek Sikorsky, currently a member of the European Parliament, uh, former longtime foreign minister of Poland, once recalled how uh, in a meeting with um, Putin in the Kremlin, when he accompanied Donald Tusk, the then prime minister of Poland, Putin actually proposed to Poland to partition uh, Ukraine. So the Poland takes the Western half and Russia takes the Eastern half. And, and uh, Radek recalls how they're sort of looking at each other with Tusk and, and saying, what is this? Is this a provocation? Are they filming us? I mean, what, what is this supposed to be? This is the 21st century, not the, not the 18th. Uh, but this is his mindset. Uh, and so to him, these are vassals that they have no say in, the, in, in, in their own affairs. And sort of the, the big guys in the room, the, the two superpowers as he sees it, are uh, the ones who get to decide. And, and again, all this underscores and emphasizes is just how antiquated, and anachronistic, and, and out of step of reality uh, Mr. Putin's vision is. And this, again, is true both for the aggressive near imperial foreign policy that he tries to pursue, uh, and this is certainly true for the kleptocratic, dictatorial, unaccountable authoritarian regime that he has uh, created in our own country, in Russia, that runs counter to all the trends uh, in our part of the world in the 21st century. Okay, thank you. 
Um, final questions from Aaron Reyes, and Ali, I think this is for you. Um, if Russia's centers of power understand that the EU core states, Europe, have little appetite for con confrontation with Russia, then their calculus allows them to act in any way that they want. Why won't the EU and EU powers confront Russia? You are ambassador in Paris, you have views, but please unmute yourself. So it's a good question. Uh, it's uh, we can uh, speak. Uh, I can speak hours. Uh, being in Paris, uh, why uh, uh, European Union is quite often is reticent to be at the forefront of confronting uh, Russia, uh, but uh, definitely, uh, well, two things are uh, really uh, needed uh, and uh, can be made by the European Union, U USA, and uh, our partners. That is uh, the uh, sanctions and enhanced uh, military technical uh, cooperation. Uh, those only, those only two things can stop Putin. And so far, force of Putin, power of Putin, is the um, deficiencies uh, of the West. But we are now at uh, the really pivotal moment. Either we stop Putin aggression, or he uh, would be um, blackmailing, um, uh, raising tensions all the time, and affecting not only Ukraine, but also uh, the European Union and the United States. So it's, as I said, in the interest of both of Ukraine and of the West to stop Putin now and forever. Okay, um, let me just do one quick follow-up since we have one minute. Um, some clever pundit said that Ostpolitik, which the new chancellor of Germany reaffirmed, is actually ostrich politik. Um, what do you think about that? Even for a Thai diplomat, it's difficult to criticize foreign leaders. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, ostrich uh, diplo uh, attitude, and uh, definitely we are now at the juncture when uh, uh, even words are not so important. The actions are important. Okay. And if we are, have trouble, some leaders, even with right words, so we are in trouble. <laughs> All right. I'd like to thank everybody for joining this panel. I especially like to thank Yelena and Zach for their wonderful work on Bielovirja, which provided the basis for our conversation today. And of course, Vladimir Oliek and Hannah offering wonderful commentary from their different perspectives in their different countries, so to speak. So thank you all and all for tuning in and uh, more to come in the future from the Eurasia Center on the ongoing crisis in Europe that's basically a function of one man's imperial obsessions. Thank you all very much. And thank you for moderation. <laughs>